Well, hello again. This is Alistair McGrath helping you to get the most out of my textbook, Christian Theology and Introduction, which is now in its sixth edition. And you remember that its first part looked at some landmarks in the history of Christian theology. But we now come to the second part of the book. And as you can see, this has four chapters exploring questions of sources and methods in Christian theology. This part of the textbook looks at how Christian theology develops and validates its ideas. And it focuses on questions such as the nature of revelation or indeed the relation of reason and faith. I'm recording these presentations very informally at my home in rural Oxfordshire. I can't get into Oxford to record them in a university lecture theatre or a library because the United Kingdom is in lockdown at the moment on account of the coronavirus pandemic. So these presentations are much more informal than usual. I hope you'll find that makes them a lot more interesting and easier to follow. So we begin with the fifth chapter of the textbook, in which we look at some preliminary issues in the study of Christian theology. For example, how the discipline of Christian theology has been understood down the ages. And the important point to appreciate here is that the word theology has changed its meaning over time. And very often there is a study like, for example, spirituality, which were originally seen as part of theology, have now be, been seen as independent fields of study. And many scholars feel this leads to fragmentation of a discipline, leading to a separation of, for example, the rational and the emotional aspects of the Christian faith. So what do we mean when we talk about theology? Well, let's look at two definitions of theology to help us get started. These come from Catholic and Anglican perspectives and e others could easily be added. And these help us to think through what theology is all about. The first comes from the Catholic theologian Karl Rahner, who's widely regarded as one of the most significant theological voices of the 20th century. Here's what he says. Theology is the science of faith. It is a reflective and methodical illumination and unfolding of a divine revelation received in faith. Now, Rana wrote those words in German, and that's my very loose English translation of what he wrote. And I think the key point to pick up here is that Rana understands theology not as the science of God, but as a science of faith. It explores and it unfolds the content of faith seriously and systematically. And I think this is a great way of starting to think about the nature and function of theology. So let's look at another approach. This time from the Anglican writer John Macquarie, who actually I got to know well back in the 1980s when he was Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity at Oxford University. And this comes from his Principles of Christian Theology, which was widely read in the 1970s. Here's his definition. Theology may be defined as the study which, through participation in and reflection upon the religious faith, seeks to express the content of this faith in the clearest and most coherent language available. Now, I like that. Uh, I think it uh, recognises that theology arises primarily within the community of faith, as it tries to make sense of its faith. Again, remember Anselm, faith-seeking understanding. And notice also how Macquarie speaks about theology in terms of both participation and reflection. Now, maybe that was implicit in Rano's definition, but Macquarie makes it explicit. Now, both Rano and Macquarie can be seen as echoing an idea we already noticed in Augustine and Anselm of Canterbury, namely that part of the inner dynamic of the life of faith is a desire to understand what is believed. And Anselm expresses this in the Latin slogan I mentioned in an earlier presentation. Fides quaerens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. And the basic idea here is you come to faith and then you want to explore this new way of thinking. Now, this, of course, raises a very interesting question. Is theology best studied from a perspective of faith or from a neutral perspective? That's a good question. And we consider it in the section on of this chapter entitled Commitment and Neutrality in Theology. And this debate became really important in the 12th century with the founding of the University of Paris. So let me tell you a bit about this. 
Bernard of Clairvaux, a monastic theologian, held that theology was basically about a committed defence of the Christian faith. But others, like Peter Abelard, a theologian at the University of Paris, argued that theology was an academic discipline which demanded neutrality and detachment on the part of its practitioners. So, which is right? Well, the debate remains unresolved, and each view has a number of significant arguments in its favour, and we talk about this in this chapter, I think you'll find that really interesting. So let's look at the layout of this chapter in more detail. The first major question we look at is the nature of faith. And Christian theologians have traditionally made a distinction between faith as a set of beliefs and faith as an act of believing. And you need to know about two Latin phrases that are often used in the theological literature to express this difference between the content of faith and the act of faith. Here's the first, fides quae creditur, which can be loosely translated as the faith we believe. And this refers to an objective set of formal beliefs, such as those we find, for example, in the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. And these are understood to provide an outline of the basic beliefs of the Christian faith. The second Latin phrase is fides qua creditor. Sounds very similar to the first one, but it's different. This can be translated as the faith by which we believe. And it refers to a subjective act of trust or assent by which individual believers accept and appropriate the basic ideas of the Christian faith. One of the core elements of the Christian understanding of faith is an attitude of informed trust in God. And we find this, for example, in the Old Testament account of the calling of Abraham in Genesis 15. So is faith simply an act of human trust or is God somehow involved in this process? Does God help us to come to faith? And this question became important during the Pelagian controversy, which explored the interplay of the human and the divine in faith and salvation. And we touched on this in the first chapter, and we'll consider it in much more detail in the 14th chapter. Here's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, published in 1990, which offered what I think is quite a useful perspective on this question, noticing that both God and the individual believer have contributions to make to the process of coming to faith and growing in faith. So listen to this, see what you think. Believing is possible only by grace and the interior help of the Holy Spirit. But it's no less true that believing is an authentically human act, trusting in God and cleaving to the truths he has revealed is contrary neither to human freedom nor to human reason. So that's a useful quote to think about. So let's return to reflect on the nature of theology in more detail. This chapter offers a working definition of Christian theology as a systematic study of the fundamental ideas of the Christian faith. Now, obviously, that needs expanding and discussing, but actually it's quite a good starting point for our reflections. And the chapter also provides a useful exploration of the historical development of the idea of theology and the development of theology as an academic discipline. Now, some people rightly worry that theology is often understood in very cerebral or rational ways, which don't do justice to the relational or the emotional aspects of faith. Now, I want to emphasize that is a fair point. But it's helpful here to return to the writings of Augustine of Hippo. Augustine makes a very helpful distinction between theology as an intellectual activity and theology as a form of engaged knowledge that emotionally connects the knower to the known. And for Augustine, theology is much more than just an intellectual understanding of faith. It's about enabling a deeper and closer relationship between the believer and God. This chapter also explores the architecture of theology, looking at the various elements of theology as a discipline, and all of these can be woven together. Now it's clear from reading works of theology from the patristic period and the Middle Ages that the word theology once embraced a wide variety of disciplines that we now regard as separate or distinct. 
And I note seven elements in this chapter. Biblical studies, systematic theology, philosophical theology, historical theology, practical or pastoral theology, spirituality, sometimes called mystical theology, and apologetics. Now, all of these can be linked together, but very often they are treated in isolation. And in this chapter, I explore each of these elements and reflect on their place in a coherent approach to theology. We then move on to look at the relationship between orthodoxy and heresy. Are all theological positions equally valid? Does Christianity consist of a spectrum of intellectual possibilities, or are there certain ways of thinking about Christianity or God that are inadequate and are thus to be rejected for that reason? And this section assesses the theological importance of the ideas of orthodoxy and heresy, engaging especially with the 19th century German theologian F. D. E. Schleiermacher. Finally, we move on to consider theological understandings of the relationship of Christianity and secular culture. And that's an important theological question. It became really important in the early Christian period when Christianity was not recognized as a legal religion within the Roman Empire. And so Christians tended to see Roman culture as hostile to their faith. And indeed, one of the most important controversies in the early church concerned the extent to which Christians could appropriate the immense cultural legacy of the classical world, like poetry, philosophy, and literature, to in effect explain or communicate their faith. And that was a very important question because many early Christian writers studied classical rhetoric as a means of improving their preaching and writing and thus communicate their faith to those outside the church. But there were those who felt that using any secular Roman cultural resources amounted to compromising the Christian faith. So the question was this, should Christianity turn its back on the classical heritage, or should it appropriate, even if in a somewhat modified form? Justin Martyr is a good example of a Christian writer who adopted what some see as a rather uncritically positive approach to secular culture, whereas Tertullian took a rather more negative approach a century later. When the Roman Emperor Constantine converted in 313, that changed everything. There were now new possibilities for the interaction of Christianity and culture, and if the Roman state could now be seen positively by Christians, why should they not also value its cultural heritage? And in the end, Augustine of Hippo set out this very important idea of the critical appropriation of secular culture. Whatever was good or true or beautiful in secular Roman culture could be used in the service of the gospel. And that proved a very influential approach. But this issue about the relation of Christian theology and secular culture remains important and debated. And during the 20th century, the American theologian Richard Niebuhr set out five theological paradigms or frameworks for understanding possible relationships between theology and culture. One of the best known is Christ against culture which he associated with Tertullian, which encourages opposition, separation, and hostility on the part of Christianity towards culture. And Niebuhr contrasted this with their Christ of culture approach, which attempts to bring culture and Christianity together, regardless of their divergences. Clearly, important questions for discussion there. So that was a very brief overview of the fifth chapter of Christian theology and introduction. And it prepares the ground for the next chapter, which focuses on the critically important question of the sources of Christian theology. I look forward to speaking to you again soon about that topic. Thank you so much for listening and goodbye.